Hello and welcome to Man's Model Moments at the correctly scheduled time of 7.30. Um, Mayor Culpa, for, uh, for those of you who may not be here, um, but maybe if you're seeing it for the replay um, that we're waiting around, uh, probably from Australia and New Zealand this morning. I didn't even realise until I got into the studio tonight um, at uh, 7 o'clock. I wasn't even sure what time I'd scheduled this for. Uh, I only got back from the shop at around 6 p.m. this evening, knowing that I had the live stream um, around 7. So I got in just before 7, saw that, saw the comments, I thought, what? And then I realised it was at 7.30 a.m. scheduled. So apologies, uh, complete balls up from uh, from my point of view. StreamYard has this really weird interface when you're scheduling. Uh, those of you who know StreamYard will, will know this. So you schedule a time, and then you've got to put AM or PM, and it's just like a little, um, almost like a toggle that you just do. And it's really unclear, even when you scheduled it, whether you've got the right one or not. So I shall endeavor. I'll, I'll do two things, OK? I'll, I'll endeavor to be better at that in the future. Secondly, I will actually schedule an early morning um, live stream just specifically for those um, people, folks down under in other parts of the world where uh, you're basically on the wrong time. <laughs> when, when your morning is my evening, that, that kind of thing. Um, because I think that you guys made the effort um, to actually come and see the live stream and I wasn't here. Uh, I think it's only fair that I... I return the favour uh, and get up when I normally wouldn't and uh, and do a stream for you guys. So, um, so hi James, hi John, hi Andy. Oh, from Wincanton, excellent. Um, hi Johnny. Uh, we've got oh, it's uh, we're up to twelve. Uh, that was more than I expected at uh, at this short notice, but I'll crack on. So I haven't until tonight. I haven't touched the hunter. Uh, the eagle-eyed among you, and I show you, will see that there is a little difference here. And that is because I gamefully employed my time, apart from writing apologies, um, over the last half an hour, to actually uh, do a bit of masking and spraying, because this is the scheme we are doing, um, the one that flew under Tower Bridge, um, flown by Alan Pollock. And you can't see it very well on this. And I'm going backwards. Uh, the wingtips are actually white. I didn't realize that before. So I just masked those off. I actually sprayed them with white um, rattle can primer. So what I actually used was, was this. So nothing special. Um, and I thought, well, watching me mask. Uh, there'll be plenty of masking tonight, don't worry, if you've... <laughs> Uh, if you've specially tuned in to see some masking, you will see masking tonight. Um, but I thought, you know, all masking is pretty much the same um, when using tape. I should be using other things as well. But um, I thought I'd get those quickly uh, knocked out. Uh, literally, it took four times as long to mask those up as to spray them. But very easy. I'm actually using this washi tape. Um, so this is just some cheap washi tape I got off Amazon just to try out. It's really low tack. In fact, you've had enough of looking at me now, so let me show you the actual aircraft. So it's really low tack. Um, this washi tape. Um, I wouldn't use it for like really delicate work because of that. To me, uh, Hobby 2000 stuff is still better than that. But for its price, I thought I'd give it a go. And uh, the times I've used it, I've been pretty impressed with it, actually. Especially in terms of putting it over paint where you don't want to then pull off pieces. You see, all of this pre-shading that I did previously is untouched. I mean, it should be right. It's it's been it's cured for a week, so it would be pretty poor if it came off. But I have had paint be pulled off, no matter 
how long it's been on a model before. So, yeah. Uh, hello, David. Hi, Ivan. So, there we go. That's a pretty nice, clean white wingtip. And that'll allow us uh, to mask that off again quite cleanly. And the reason I masked it off rather than just spraying it, obviously, is I do want to preserve all of the pre shading. Let's see if I can do this without pulling off the pito tube that I put on last time. I mentioned last time I, I'm not a fan of pieces which incorporate pito tubes in on the build so that you are forced to deal with the pito tube all the time that you're doing all of this masking and faffing around it. Um, I think it's just inviting disaster. So the loss of a pito tube is hardly terrible. It is an annoyance that you then have to deal with. So there we go. So that's this is basically how we left the hunter last time with the slight addition of white wing tips. Now uh, my compressor is charged, so hopefully we can get a decent amount out before it comes on again and makes everything wobble. Uh, haven't even sanded the tip X off off here yet. I'll get to that. That is if I don't throw everything all over the place. All right. Oops. Put this up a bit so you get a bit more of the workbench. You know, I'm sure a lot of live streams consists of moving cameras about. All right. So obviously, in terms of masking uh, with this scheme, British fighters at the time had this hard demarcation line, so we do need to mark off. Now, I probably won't for this piece until we actually get to upper surface painting, um, because it probably doesn't matter too much on this leading edge uh, because it's a very light color should take just on there. because it's a very light color light aircraft gray we're going to be doing this with it probably won't make too much difference on this you're not going to see a lot of tonal variation anyway because it's a very thin edge so i won't worry about that too much but certainly for these edges I want to have that hard demarcation line um, to preserve the undershading and the priming so that we're working from the same space rather than um, messing around and you know having some areas light some areas just primed pito tube you can see actually where it wasn't masked it's got a little bit of white on there but hey right so nerd glasses on Let's see where that demarcation line actually comes from. So basically from the root of the wing through to just under there. Okay. One of the other things I like about this tape is it's very easy to replace it put it on and then take it off again which when you're doing this sort of thing I find is really super super useful so what I'm doing is I'm just anchoring down by the wing root where I know I've got to go and then just looking for exactly where I want to put that um, which I think Is just about there. We actually have a couple basically parallel to this panel line here. Now, of course, 
a lot of these 60s aircraft, a lot of aircraft in general, have curves to them. So in order to achieve a straight line like this, you actually do have to go up slightly when it curves quite sharply in at the exhaust. Which is why I'm getting this crinkly effect, which you can't see. Because the tail is obscuring it. Let me keep off. Turn it around so you can see. So yeah, because I'm coming straight across here, then this bit is curling up because obviously I am actually slightly pulling the tape up to make sure that I've got that preserved. Keep that hard edge going as straight as I can. Okay. I'm going to sort of tuck it into the exhaust pipe, because of course we did spray in there last time. So ideally you don't want to get over spray of light aircraft grey into there. Once again, I'm just going to anchor up that wing root. And then again, take that parallel to that. Panel line all the way down across to there. And just smooth that in. Now, one of the things I always find annoying uh, about aircraft rear ends is, of course, you have the horizontal stabilizers, which you have to spray the undercolor right next to the rudder vertical stabilizer which you have to spray the upper color so it's necessary to do some fiddly rc masking right in that bit so i also bought some thinner washi tape because yes you can cut masking tape and Tammy tape cuts quite well, but if you don't have to, much easier just to use thinner tape. The other thing is never expect these to be straight, right? Because there are always bits that don't quite work. So what I usually try to do is, as I've done here, hello taggers, and hi Phil. Um, it does look a bit like a, a plaster, as we would call them here in the UK, a bit of band aid in the US. Um, so, what I've done here is actually managed to slot it between the rudder and the vertical stabilizer and the horizontal stabilizer, where that rear piece just comes away. So that ensures I'm right up against the the vertical and the horizontal join on that rear piece. And I can come in again and go kind of flat across on the horizontal stabilizer. Well, against the horizontal stabilizer, of course, I'm masking off the vertical stabilizer. And do that right up against it. Yeah, these come in all sorts of colours. I just grabbed the first one that came to hand, which happens to be this weird flesh colour. <laughs> so I always tend to get much more masking tape than I actually need. Some of the hazards of the way these things look. So hopefully there you can see, go up as tight as I can to that horizontal stabilizer without actually uh, going on it. And so when I've got these odd little bits left, I usually try to find odd little bits like this rear piece here. I need masking just to use it up.
the joy of masking. Now the 148th TSR2. It can't need a lot of masking for overall white. You need to mask the, uh, mask the nose off for some black. That's about it. <laughs> Hi, David. Uh, I'm knee typing. So I think we've got most of that side. Moving on to the other side. I usually find tweezers are the best way to get into these spaces as well. With masking tape. Because masking tape, of course, wants to stick to everything apart from what you're actually trying to mask. And if anything, if I do go over on one surface, I'll under mask this because again, I'm going over a lighter colour to kind of move on to the upper surfaces. And the way I mask is I always try to mask or, or try to paint lighter colours before darker for obvious reasons, really. You make a mistake. Um, it's easier to go over it with a darker colour than it is to come back and over a dark colour with a light colour. Ugh, being a bit of an ass. Right, still, we're, we're getting there. Left my masking on my finger. I think masking must be one of my, not my least favourite jobs, but it's just one of those things that you just feel, you don't feel like you're achieving much. until you've actually finished it and sprayed and then peeled it off you only really feel a sense of achievement when you're getting rid of it you know so it feels like you're wasting time because you don't see you know you're investing in the future with masking i guess that's the way to look at it Now, I'm not going to fastidiously mask all of this aircraft because one, that would be extremely boring for you guys. And two, I never think it's really necessary. What you need to do is think about where you're going to spray and where the overspray is going to go and just prevent that. Right, so I'm being diligent on these rear pieces because I am going to be, you know, up here and spraying, you know, right up to these pieces. So it's going to go here. That's where the air is going to, to blast out. And it's going to go out and across. So I need to mask those pieces so that I'm sure that all the bits where it could go are covered. Apart from that, I don't really give it them. Minimalistic modeling. <laughs> Doing what you need to do, not necessarily all you should do. And again, because it's a lighter colour, I only really need to preserve where it's going to potentially affect any of the um, shading. So, so if I'm spraying this piece, 
and I get a bit of overspray on here. It's going to be like dusting, right? It's not really going to have much effect on the pre-shading. So again, do we really care that much? Probably not. You know, a little bit of overspray, a little bit of tonal variation, actually. The well, bad thing is when it looks artificial, but it might be bad. Um, so I'm just going to do the same thing now on these wings. So obviously we're going to spray up to the wing roots from underneath. So I'm making sure that these bits are covered so I don't get the spray going up. Like so. I don't want to like, form some little traps. There we go. So just like that. So that it's when I spray here, it's not then sort of going down across. And then what I'll typically do, which I'm going to do here, is I typically just cheat. <laughs> I'll just mask all along the edge like that again, just to minimize the amount of overspray that's going that, that direction without actually masking the top itself. <laughs> which is cheating, I guess, but it works. <laughs> More or less. More or less. Again, I'm going to do the same on this front. Because we do have that sawtooth. And as I mentioned, we do have like the leading edge of this lapped over, but I'm not going to worry about that. Now we will do some stuff here, but that's not going to be tape. So the hard line comes from the bottom of that intake. Tape, uh, paint bleed under tape, yeah. So this, this washi tape isn't bad. Um, I've used it a couple of times. The main thing is, I can take that off a second actually. Uh, the main thing is don't get your, your model absolutely saturated in paint. So light mist coats are going to be your friend. Um, you stand much, much less chance. So I'm just trying to work out where I've actually got to mask to here. Uh, much, much less chance of getting paint bleed if you're putting less paint um, onto the actual model. Which, which sounds that's bloody obvious, right? But it's one of those things that might be obvious, but it doesn't necessarily mean we do it. <laughs> You know, happens to us all, the do as I say, not as I do bit. I think that is going slightly up. Trying to get a straight line when you've got no reference for it. The model sometimes is challenging. It's proving to be a little here for me. Unfortunately, I've made this piece of tape a little bit too short. Which is a bugger. Um, now, actually, as we have just looking at this now, and as that hard line is to the bottom there, I think we can actually just mask off that intake completely. I don't think there's any part of it that requires the lower surface colour. In fact, because we've got that hard lip, we can actually mask it across on that on that lip. And actually lip over. So we're completely sealing. The other thing is we need to be careful about where we go to. There we go. 
that actually worked quite well. Serendipitously, it was through ants rather than design, but hey, I'll take it. The Afro Vulcan on sale for under £40. That is a really good deal. Um, I can't sell the Vulcan for less than 65 really. Um, it would, well, I wouldn't make anything. In fact, it would cost me money if I sold it at that price. I think what Amazon probably did is they bought a whole bunch of stock from Airfix at the lower point, price point, you know. Airfix probably wanted to clear stock because of the black book stuff coming up. I can't say I'm terribly impressed uh, with Airfix in terms of that business practice. You know, it doesn't really support small retailers. It really shafts us because we've already bought the stock and we can't clear it. And of course, people are going to buy the cheaper kits. Of course they are. I would. Um, I just have to wait until those prices go. Which means that, of course, it's dead money sitting on the shelf until that time. So it's not a great business practice, however you look at it. It's not good for the shop, you know, not to have stock flowing through. Anything just sat on the shelf and not, you know, sitting there and being sold is a bit of a killer. And then they wonder why model shops go out of business. Like, well, if you want a model shop, you have to support it, both as a retailer, uh, both as a a wholesaler, you know, a supplier, and as a customer. And of course, shop has to offer something beyond what's available elsewhere. That's the kind of contract, right? Um, I try and help my customers as much as I can, you know, with advice, with just general conversation. Um, you know, I've had some really good chats with people coming in the shop. You know, we'll spend an hour chatting, you know, and sometimes not buy anything. Sometimes they will. And, uh, you know, I don't limit that. And that is what I believe a good retail experience should be like, right? So Amazon's cheap, but you're never going to get advice from Amazon. Other than, you know, suggested products just based on your prior browsing history. I actually get the thing I don't get about the not very clever AI is it isn't very <laughs> because I'll just buy something and then it recommends other things I've just bought. It's like, yeah, I've just bought it. I don't need to buy another. Oh, it's being sold on the by the Airfix store on Amazon. That's interesting. As Airfix are now selling uh, the standard Avro Vulcan at full price, seventy two forty nine. Uh, the shop isn't going bad actually which is i mean it's it's good and bad right so i lost my main consultancy um that'll end uh, the end of this week basically probably the 13th ironically um which was how i was funding you know my life well, that's uh, paying my mortgage paying my bills all of that sort of stuff and of course, I have not been looking for alternatives to that because that was, you know, taking up most of my time. And uh, getting getting the shop ready was you know, hard work, doing full time job and that. So, in one sense, it's good because I can now spend I spend like the whole time at the shop now. So I open I open at eleven because it is a, a twenty minute drive for me to get to the shop. I've got to get the dog sorted. 
um, I've got, you know, I still have some YouTube bits to, to try and fit in as well. Um, and to be honest, you know, opening at nine o'clock wouldn't make a, a damn bit of difference to most people. <laughs> Um, in Wincanton, it's it's hardly like it's a thriving metropolis like London, where people are getting up, you know, at the crack of dawn to do stuff and just pop into the shop. So, eleven o'clock, I think, is fine. I do eleven till five. I often don't leave. Like today, I left at um, just after five thirty. So I had a customer come in just before five, and um, again, we got chatting. You know, chatting about his grandfather. I was chatting about mine, talking about aircraft, and you know, all the good stuff, which. I think it's one of the great benefits and joys of having a shop like that, both ways. You know, the customers can can come in and do that, and I get to to experience that, and also share you know, my knowledge and experience and anecdotes and stuff. Um, let me just try and mask this. Uh, but of course, that also means that it is taking up all of my time which is why I haven't been able to get any videos out. Despite the fact I've got videos almost completely ready to go, I've just got to record audio um, and mesh that in. However, I do find uh, the, the longest piece of editing for me is the, the audio, um, because I record audio separately. Uh, I'm not a spontaneous video maker. Like Some people can just record uh, and just slam it out with the audio that I recorded there. That's not me. So I record all of my um, video. Then I will patch that all together. Then I will go back and watch that and uh, write my script. And then I'll record that. So I get good audio, and then I'll splice that into the, the video. So it's a, you know, you could argue that that is a rather redundant process, but it gets the best that I feel I want out of the video. Unfortunately, <laughs> it is exactly that. It is time consuming. Um, I'm now working between two locations. So the computer I used to have in my front room is now at the shop because it's also my, you know, where I keep all my stock stuff. I mean, it's a cloud-based system, but it's, I've got a lot of my other files and stuff that I'm working on whilst I'm there. Um, so I do try to use some of the downtime at the shop to do some YouTube stuff to record more video. Um, so yeah, it's it's good. Uh, it's not making enough at the moment to break even. Um, and certainly not making enough to support me. Which um, is a tad worrying. Long term. So I am also looking for another role. Another consultancy contract which is difficult when you're doing a full-time job as well and trying to do YouTube stuff. So not I, I don't mean this to be a bleeding heart story. It's certainly not that. And if the shop could make enough money, I would be very, very happy just doing that. You know, if I could make enough money between YouTube and the shop to just pay my mortgage and my bills on both the house and the shop, I would be as happy as Larry, but that's a way off, <laughs> I feel, because I hadn't, I kind of weren't, um, I hadn't planned on the time scale of getting the shop self-sufficient, if that makes sense. So I thought I'd have more time um, with my consultancy work. Because obviously that was buying all the stock, that was you know doing all the other stuff. Um, obviously made less time for, for doing the actual shop, which is why I was only open during the lunch times. Um, prior to now, 
um, but of course I can't just order you know, two thousand pounds worth of, of paints now um, because my consultancy will pay for it because it won't. That money has to come from somewhere. And again, if it's not selling, it's just dead money. Right? It's just money sitting there on the shelf. So I would love to be able to buy you know loads and loads of things. So I did just spot a question. From Stuart, um, keep forgetting I can show these things. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> I do not sell Mr. Colour Paints. I would love to sell Mr. Colour Paints. I have not yet get a supplier who can, a wholesaler, an importer, um, that I can get them from. And again, it's about investing in the range. So putting paints up, and you may be surprised about this, the next paint range I am getting in will be Humbrol Acrylic, uh, sorry, Humbrol Enamels. And I know a lot of you there might be saying, what the hell? <laughs> Why would you do that? Well, I've got an awful lot of um, of railway models that come in. And guess what? They use Humbrol Enamels. Um, so Humbrol Enamels are going to be the next paint range. But if you were a person, like all of you guys, normal retail experience, you buy a pot of Humbrol and it's what, a couple of quid. Um, that is your experience. As a retailer, consider I have to buy a minimum number of every colour I order. So if I order 10 colours, I actually have to order 60. Yeah, that's minimum. Um, so to get the whole range, when I got the whole Tamiya range in, just acrylics, it was a lot of money. I mean, four figures. Uh, same with the outlaw paints. I'm only stocking the military range to start with because otherwise, um, and also James was good about the, the minimum order quantity because if I'd stocked the full range and if I'd stocked the minimum normal order quantities, that would have been a five-figure sum in gbp not, not us dollars um so you know you're easily talking about a twenty thousand dollar investment on one brand of paints to stock in the shop and then if people don't buy them because they're new and they don't know about them you've got a twenty thousand dollar dead weight in your shop now obviously if you would spent that on kits those kits would probably start to move through um but that, that's the whole thing, right? You've got to try and guess what people want, <laughs> which is hard, which is why I've tried to bro stock the broadest range I can. So I've got Hobby Boss, I've got Trumpeter, I've got I Love Kit, I've got Meng, um, Ryfield Model, uh, Mini Art, ICM, uh, Hasegawa. I have got some um, Zvezda, imported pre-war. Um, what else have I got? Oh, and I can get almost anything like Sokimura and, you know, really obscure stuff. Um, I can get pretty much anything. Uh, kinetic, you know, and stuff. Um, but if you think, if you're buying, say, a Hella um, 1 16th scale kit, um, you know, of a retail price of £120, uh, and I'm buying that for... Well, that, that's the mass easy. I'm buying it for 90, right? Um, you know, that's it's not a big margin. And you've then got to think, well, if I sell it at 120, people probably aren't going to buy it because they can find it cheaper elsewhere. So I'll sell it for 100. Yep, so I've already taken 20 pounds off. From your margin, that's a massive cut in your profits. So your margin goes down from like 20 five percent to ten um and then if somebody doesn't buy it so it's like do you buy that kit or do you buy you know three airfix kits which you might not make as much on but might sell quicker so it's a real i mean i've been in commercial for a long time um so it's just getting a feel and juggling all of this but it's um it's not as easy as you might first think when you think oh yeah you know it must be great but and it is in many many ways i wouldn't not do the shop um but i also wouldn't necessarily recommend anybody else do the shop 
if that makes sense. <laughs> um, Taggers, I'll come back to that question in a second because that's a really good one. Um, but Paul, yes, I will be doing Outlaw. I will be stocking Outlaw from when they are imported in November. So they will be released at the Telford show. I will be one of the few exclusive um, retailers at the beginning. So we have a, a short period of exclusivity before um, James and Jason are going to open it up to, to others. Uh, basically, because you know we invested early, uh, so yes, uh, definitely will be stocking outlaw, and uh, I will be uh, at the moment. I'm just finishing off the Beaufort, the ICM Beaufort, which originally I was waiting for ICM paints, but the ICM paint matches are, let's see, not ideal. <laughs> so I'm going to be doing that in outlaw paints. I think it's going to be good. Taggers, this is a really good question. What manufacturer has been the best for you so far? From retailer experience of buying through to you selling them as retailer. Um, they're very different experiences, right? The retail experience of, you know, just buying a kit, uh, I would have to say probably Airfix because, you know, buying direct from them has, has generally been pretty good using Hornby Hobby Points and, um, you know, the free delivery of £30 and all those things um, are generally, uh, plus I am a Navix Club member, so you get that discount and stuff. Um, they are, however, the worst uh, experience as a retailer. Um, I get the lowest margins on Airfix products. Um, I, I did think originally that I got the highest margin, but I didn't realize that the prices they were quoting didn't include tax. Um, so they were 20% higher. Um, so yeah, Airfix, Airfix unfortunately are still stuck in, I would say a 1990s distribution model. So to place an order with Airfix, I get my Airfix price list on Excel. I choose what I want. I send it to my rep. Uh, and then the rep, um, you know, gets it processed at the office. Um, if some of those things are out of stock, um, they might be flagged before it comes to me for invoice. So then I'll pay for the invoice, say it's a thousand pounds, right? And then a couple of days later, well, yeah, a couple of days later, I'll get my notification of when it's going to be delivered. Say two days after that, it's delivered. And I'll find out 850 pounds worth of kits have been delivered, right? And then I'll, on my invoice, it'll say which ones are out of stock. So I've got a credit then at, at Hornby. Um, but it doesn't say that on the invoice. I actually have to ask the office <laughs> what my credit is. There is nothing online. Every other wholesaler and manufacturer has an online portal that I can order through. Um, so Airfix, unfortunately, need to look at their their ideas in their game. I can understand why the distribution model in the rest of the world for Airfix is not as developed as, as other manufacturers because it is not as good an experience. So thank you, Paul. That's um, that's good to hear that you had a uh, good experience. <laughs> um, I have, I mean, I personally had great experiences in the shop from people that have come in. You know, I, I haven't had any that I was just thinking, God, you know, I hope they don't come back. Um, I've had some really good chats. I've got some really um, good regulars now. Um, you know, it's, I think retail is, as I say, it's the first time I've, I've done retail. I've been a commercial for my whole working life. But, um, Retail has never been one of those, but actually I really enjoy it. I think it's because it is a niche, right? Um, <laughs> I've made the Hunter. What are you talking about? I love great tits. <laughs> I've made it. I just need to paint it. Uh, I keep getting distracted by people asking me questions. Not my fault, Gov. Right. It does uh, raise a good question. Though. I should actually get this some paint on this, shouldn't I? Uh, I'm just going to slap a bit more masking on the back of this uh, optical stabilizer.
Now, if you ask me whether I would open shop knowing what I know now about my change in circumstance, if I was told, right, you know, in uh, October, you are not going to have that consultancy, that main consultancy that's going to be, you know, that's funded everything so far. Do you still do the shop? It's a really difficult question. I, I, I honestly don't know what my answer would be. I have to think really hard about it because I do really enjoy the shop. But, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, it is. It is strange, James. Um, I mean, I've been a distributor. I, I think I've mentioned this in Netflix and Chill several times. I've mentioned it, I think, on the live streams as well. I've been a distribution manager for emerging markets and for um, Western Europe as well. Um, and it's just odd when you're sitting on the other side of the fence and you think, this isn't what I would do, <laughs> you know, in, in this relationship. I would, you know, pay much more attention to, uh, to what this, you know, you've got, you've got to keep distributors happy because they are lifeboat. And Netflix has a strange one because they are also competing directly against their own distributors, right, which is already a weird thing. Um, but, you know, I went into it with my eyes open on that. You just have to accept it and give the feedback you know, where where you can. Um, right. Let's... So the underside of a hunter was light aircraft grey, which you don't have anything specific. That's fine. I think I'm going to go with. This light grey, this Vallejo light grey. It's that 17990 light grey. Um, mixed with... Uh, trying to find an ICM light grey. But maybe I can't find it. We'll have to go with a white instead. Mm. I think I'm just going to go with some to me white. Now, where is my airbrush? Now, it is here somewhere because I specifically brought it. Okay, here we go. Okay, we have air. Let's have some thinner. Let's move the keyboard so I don't spot the thinner all over the keyboard. So we we'll go with this light grey to start with, and then we'll see what it looks like, and make adjustments if I feel we need them. I think actually it's probably fine as it is. Let's see. All right, so. As I said, I'm just going to be doing mist coats on this because, well, one, I don't want to get bleed through, right, as I mentioned before. And secondly, uh, we don't want to obliterate the pre shading we've done. Right?
So people complain about Vallejo um, spraying. This is just normal model air, uh, not model air, uh, model color, whatever it's called. Yeah, model color. Um, you know, it's, it's fine. Certainly for this kind of thing. You just gotta make sure you thin it. Oops, a little bit of a spatter. Of course, I haven't done the inside of the flaps, but I will brush paint those, I think. Otherwise, it's more masking, and nobody wants more masking. <laughs> oh, now. I'm going to remember today. There. <laughs> Hop on. Difficulty here is well, it's trying to actually make sure you guys can see what I'm doing, which does make painting a bit interesting. <laughs> there, that's there's a wing I've just done. <laughs> the other thing about Vallejo paints is. They smell really good. <laughs> I don't know what it is they use in terms of their their binder or their thinner or something. It just smells really nice. Well, what it is it smells great. It's probably something highly poisonous, carcinogenic, will be banned by the EU in ten years or something. So you can see I'm just I'm just misting on enough just to give the colour, but not to completely obliterate the pre-shading we've done. So we talked about bleed through and stuff before. You can see I'm hardly even getting enough on the model to make it wet. So the only bit that's even looking slightly damp is this, this bit back here. Because we've already got the primer on, right? So really, we're just adding colour. We're not... I mean, it's more than the filter, but we don't need to, you know, prime the thing. So there we go. We did some painting. How about that? I did a thing. Now, what I'm going to do now 
Please add some of that white. But I think first I'm going to take out some of the blue I've got there. Uh, I am also a heretic and I do put paint back in the bottle. Terribly. Well, if I can hit the bottle. Within reason, of course, if I <laughs> when I've mixed it now, I'm not going to. Once I put this white in, because uh, it's not that paint anymore, right? And I just end up with a whole bunch of weird colours. Which in itself isn't bad, but um, I just wouldn't know where I was with them. Uh, put some more thing in there. Give it a mix. This will do. It's a bit thick. I do indeed do delivery. Uh, so um, another David actually bought a uh, an F35B Timia 172nd kit and a 172nd scale Airfix uh, mosquito bomber. Uh, last night, and uh, those are all packed up, waiting for the posty. Sorry, I'm just back flushing this uh, to mix. Waiting for posty to pick them up tomorrow morning. So, at the moment, I only deliver in the UK, and primarily that's because uh, it's just postage is so expensive outside of outside of the UK. Uh, Brexit really screwed us. Uh, I mean, we screwed ourselves, but yeah, it's our own fault. But yeah, it's. Um, I, I don't feel unless I get a solution to it, which I need to establish. You know, while well, I need to get more stock in on the website and everything, I need to get my full range visible before. Oh shit! I forgot to do the other pieces first. Anyway, uh, <laughs> come back to that. Um, I don't really feel it's fair just to. Uh, you know, be charging fifteen pounds postage. Um, so you know, let me uh, just scroll up on the comments because there's a few in here. So this uh, is an interesting point. So I can tell you the rationale um, behind this, Davros. Uh, and it does actually go to the EU. <laughs> so uh, the EC classification on chemicals, uh, there's a chemical in, or there used to be a chemical in Humbro enamel paints and many other paints called Miko. Uh, I think it's methyl ether ketone oxalate or something. Um, uh, which is really good thin and plasticizer and stuff, is now determined to be a carcinogen. I think, I think it's carcinogen. Um, now, the exposure limits to some of these are, don't make any sense, right, that they get banned. So I'm just going to go over these things for anyway. But basically, Humbrol couldn't sell their enamel paints as they were. They had to be reformulated. So they had to reformulate the entire range, the entire base structure, right? Their paints, had, their enamel paints had to be reformulated. So what they did is at the same time, they thought, well, we'll also rationalize them because there are a lot of paints that we have, which people aren't buying. You know, there are certain paints that people buy a lot. And some, again, for them as a manufacturer, it doesn't make sense for them to make, you know, Imagine they make, um, you know, I don't know what the minimum paint quantity is, but say it's a thousand litres. 
of paint, right? Which they divide into 14 mil tinlets. That's a lot of tinlets. And if people aren't, you know, if that stock's going to last for 20 years, then there's no point in making that. You know, they want to turn over the stuff as well because it's dead money for them. And because they are now owned by an investment company, that investment company is going to be very aware of that. So they decided to consolidate the paint range. And because acrylics apparently are the, the future, even though acrylics have been out for like 30 years, um, they decided to invest more in their, their acrylic range, which I think, I think, to be honest, is a mistake. Because if you think, how many enamel paint ranges out there are there that you, you know, that you know of? Uh, and how many acrylic paint ranges out there? You know, there's massive competition in the acrylic paint space range with established brands like Vallejo, like Tamiya, um, relatively new companies like AK Interactive, you know, Hataka, or, you know, all these others. You've got Gunsango, Mr. Color, you know, when you can get them, excellent paints. So I think when Humbrol don't have a great name for acrylics and no particular expertise, you know, compared to some of these other companies, I think that's a very odd decision. Yes, I haven't found those and I really should have them. And uh, one of those things we'll have to deal with. So when you've done about as I have here and made a mistake basically in not climbing where I should have climbed, I'm just putting on mist coats. I think that was right. Hmm. Um, and it'll dry and then I'll put another one on and then I'll probably do another one as well. Um, because it has to activate its own prime. Not ideal, but that's what we've got. Second coat, you see, it goes on much more. Oh, well, can't see that. Second coat there, much more smooth. Uh, what do I think of Ataka paint? I've got, I mean, mixed minds about Ataka. Um, I've got a bottle here. It's medium sea grey. I did the uh, Spitfire with Ataka. If you don't mix Ataka really, really, really well, so when you buy them, I'd recommend you get a couple of paint stirring balls. I recommend you get paint stirring balls, invaluable things. I use the glass ones rather than um, metal. Some people prefer, prefer metal, but metal, they can rust. Um, the glass ones I know can break, but it's fairly rare. Um, you pay your money, you take your choice. But invaluable in mixing paint. For the Hataka, I say they're essential, because if you, if you use Hataka and it's not mixed well, it's garbage. Utter garbage, but then it's your own fault because you're not using the paint as Hataka intended. When it's mixed, it's pretty good. Um, I wouldn't say it's the best, I wouldn't say it's great, but it's pretty good. Um, <laughs> best to go grey before green. Uh, I probably will, um, but I'm going to be masking anyway, so. You know, it doesn't really matter. Uh, science of the smell. I don't know what compounds they particularly put in that make it smell the way it does. Um, I can tell you about the biology of the smell. <laughs> um... <laughs> Eight hours, 10 minutes on public transport, or an hour and 49 minutes driving. Yeah. Well, you see, I don't charge VAT at this all at the moment because I am a sole trader. So it's, my, it's taken in other ways from me at the moment, which is why I'm having to buy, including VAT. So I pay VAT on the things I buy at the moment, and then my income is taxed. Um, when you get over, I am not at the threshold where you need to register for VAT at the moment. Um, registering for VAT can be advantageous because then you get things at VAT 
uh, listed prices without VAT, but then you have to keep very detailed records and you have to charge VAT on your product. So you gain it in one way, but you also lose it on the other. So for the moment, it's too much um, trouble for me to, uh, you know, I don't have time enough as it is even to get stuff on the website. So if I had to keep really detailed accounts, which actually I already have, but, you know, it's another hassle that I don't particularly need at the moment. As you can tell, that was my compressor. So I just muted to save you the uh, the worst of it. And whilst I remember, I'm just going to clean the tip of my airbrush. Uh, so all I'm doing now is actually just reinforcing the pre shading by just going in with this lightened grey just into the center of these panels. Oh, again, you can't see that because where the camera is. So it looks extreme there because it's wet. Um, but that's what I'm doing is just going over what I've already painted. Just the center of it. I think it's because the compressor started and it must have fallen down a bit. Apologies for that. So yeah, just going over the of the panels, basically away from those lines that we did previously. Just with a bit of the lighter. It just boosts the contrast. It also always looks um, more on camera than it does in reality. Um, so the thing is, whenever you do this, it will always look worse before it gets better. So at the moment, we're really just laying the foundations of what we want to do with the model. I don't want to start my ever show with the model. That's always when we get the spatter. It's okay to go extreme, more extreme than you think you need here, because see how it, it does fade yeah, when it dries. And as I've mentioned many times, there are no dead ends here, right? So once we've actually done this, if we wanted to, if we felt we'd gone too extreme, we can just step off. So step our airbrush way back, and then we could just actually do a very light, you know, misting coat just to tie it all in together and reduce that contrast. But as you can see here, I've done this one, this panel, and now it's dried. It's almost gone.
again, it's just about building up the effect to, for it to be what you want it to be. Because again, your model, you can make it ha look however you like. So you just crack on doing this until you're happy with the effect. But do make sure that uh, you are just making sure it's dry and not making a decision based on it looking like that when it's going to go to that. <laughs> you know, that's a very different colour, very different shade to this, you know, which is actually how it's uh, going to look. A little bit too heavy on the airbrush there. But again, recoverable. You know, if you want to pick out individual panels which are a little bit lighter, you know, again, you know, just focus on them a little bit more. Go back, do it again. That will be lighter than the others. So that I think I'm happy enough with at the moment. Let me go back to okay, that's different. Good. Go back to these and put their second coat on. So don't forget them a second time. You know, we are still going to do, you know, we've still got to put decals on. We've still got to do our panel lining and the weathering we've got. Probably going to need another coat, we'll see. Okay. How are we doing for paint? No, we've got loads. Good, let's have a look. Uh, I think the threshold is something like 80 or 85 or something like that. Sorry, that's that one. All righty. Yeah, I think we are we're good in that. I'm not particularly worried about the exact shade um, on this, to be honest. Um, I mean, that's maybe a little bit too blue gray for a light aircraft gray for the RAF, but um, I don't care. <laughs> so, ideally, we would wait for this to completely dry before we start pulling tape off, but I don't think it's really going to make a difference because we don't have, it's not like we're on wet paint. So, I'm going to take these off. Obviously, I'm not going to take these lower ones off this is no reason to expose the white even though it's on the underside and hopefully this tape doesn't make me a liar and it won't show bleed through <laughs> let's see moment of truth right. try and do this on camera
That's a pretty crisp line. No bleed through. Again, you know, paint's not wet enough to... We want to make sure the paint's not wet enough to run. If, if it's wet enough to move, then it can move by capillary reaction. And that's when you get bleed under the tape, when you've got tiny, tiny gaps. So either, if you've got tape that tends to do that, and you're painting wet, you need to really make sure that you run like the edge of your nail or something along the line of the tape to try and exclude those capillary forces. But you're always going to have problems around recessed panel lines if you're painting wet because the wet paint goes straight through there. But that is a nice, crisp, non-bled through line. See? We're very clearly, I mean, more clearly on camera than on, you know, by visual eye, um, seeing the pre-shading uh, here. So you get nice crisp lines both sides of the front there. And there we go. Start of the end. <laughs> now I've got all this arsy bit around the tail. I really enjoy, I don't know about the rest of you, I really enjoy unmasking, right? Um, because, as I said before, just make sure this is somewhere that you can see stuff. Because, uh, as I said before, it's kind of the reveal, right? It kind of has that feel about it, right? As you, uh, as long as it's gone well, of course. <laughs> that awful, you know, pit of your stomach sinking feel as you see all the fingers of spidery paint that have gone underneath it. That's not such a good experience. So, I, I get that, right? Um, but generally, you know, you unveil what you have created and it's like, oh, you think, yeah, that's great. You know, I really like that kind of uh, stage of painting a model. I enjoy it even more when you don't have to mask. <laughs> If I could get it easily, I would show you my. That's actually what I should probably finish. Uh, TU22, um, but the original TU22, not the TU22M, the swing wing one, the, the old one, the booze cruiser, as they used to call it, uh, used alcohol in its um, cooling system. Well, actually, used vodka. They actually used vodka in it. Um, hence the booze cruiser. Um, but that, apart from looking like a spaceship, is just silver. It's just metal. Um, and I just did it with a rattle can. Um, obviously, there's more to do on it. But that is just the base. And that was glorious. You know, because once you've masked the... Uh, I'll just get this bit here. Because once you've got the canopies masked, it's just you just spray it. It's just like, Yes. Downside, of course, is that it shows every tiny little area you've made. Silver is a devil. I mean, this kit, you know, we I have not perfected, right? Because, as you recall, underneath, you look very carefully, you can just about see there are traces of the, the seam along here. Right. And as I said at the time, I'm not, you know, I did some smoothing work on it, but I didn't want to lose that detail. And also, the aircraft is going to be, you know, sat in its undercarriage like this. So you can't, you know, what effort am I going to put it? I say this is a, I'm maximizing my efforts here, right? I'm not going into the redundant bits of, yeah, 
there's probably 0.1 millimeters of a, a seam there in certain places that you can see if you turn it over and examine it which i'm not going to let anybody do so <laughs> it solves that problem right a lot of the maintenance panels around the edge would they be worn and battered as some models may count and do you rivet count do i rivet count i i try not to i like things to be i like things to look about right right um so i will do research on aircraft i will go out and look and i am conscious of errors um that are made so for example and i mentioned this on my airfix 124 scale spitfire video it doesn't include the wing commander's pennant which johnny johnson's aircraft absolutely did have he was a wing commander it's one of the first things applied to his spitfire when he joined the, the squadron i'm reading his uh, memoirs as many of you may know um you know that's an omission is that rivet counting no that's just a factual error right and it's easy to to remedy i, I didn't for the video because i wanted to do it as airfix had presented it likewise they don't include the extremely prominent especially in one 24 scale um canopy both emergency opening and the closing latch on the frame which is i think a pretty big omission for because it is quite visible right for that scale um it doesn't detract from the fact that it's a fantastic kit it's just somewhere that you know a modeler can add to what's presented if it's really wrong and it makes it look wrong so if they got the shape of the cowling wrong that's more of an issue right because that's going to detract from the way it looks and how pleasing it is to you so like the cromwell that they issued with the wrong number of rivets on the wheels i don't actually care you know i could put mud on it i could you know get some aftermarket wheels if i really wanted to um you know you i think there's a point at which rivet counting becomes just being arsy you know uh, and certain people like to complain no matter about what and i think you have to to measure these things you know how much have you paid what was the intent of the company how hard is it to to fix you know how bothered are you about it um you know these people that micro go into micro detail about oh well you know that's two meters too long there it's like right can you tell if you can tell okay we'll do something about it then you know that's part of modeling um, if you can't, then just shut up. <laughs> you know, worry about bigger things. It's like people tend to worry about smaller things when they don't have enough to, bigger things to worry about, right? Nobody in the Ukraine at the moment, I doubt, is feeling persecuted because of pronoun usage. They're feeling persecuted because people are putting missiles into their homes, you know? Um, that's what they're worrying about. And it's the same with modeling, right? If. Uh, if we didn't have a choice of hunters, for instance, then it would just be about who's going to do a hunter or, you know, what, uh, when could somebody do one? And because we've got a choice of hunters, then people will compare and contrast and say, oh, well, of course, the airfix hunter is wrong in this respect, but the academy one is you know, better or worse in, in this way. I think we should just be grateful, perhaps, you know, be a little bit thankful. I mean, I'm for one, are really, I just, I just feel really lucky in, in a lot of ways. You know, the, the fact that I've been able to open a model shop, even if it, even if it fails, right? Even if I have to close the shop because it won't earn enough money and I got to find a, a real job, I, I've done it. I've gone out, I've tried that. I really enjoyed it, no matter what the outcome is. And I'm really grateful that I had the opportunity, you know, um, who would have, it was always a dream i'm sure it's a dream of many people and i've made managed to make it you know for however long it lasts um i think in modeling we are so blessed you know moss and i talked about this on an episode of beyond the box about the golden age of modeling when have we ever had the choice i'll tell you when we have never had the choice that we have had today that we do have that we enjoy that is you know abundantly available for most models you know so i think uh, people just need to be happier you know this is a hobby 
It should make you happy. It shouldn't make you angry. <laughs> uh, right. I think I've managed to correct most of my mistakes and forgetfulness pieces. Apart from there's no real door. I'll just quickly. That was nicely done. We're good there. We're good. Uh, I think that's mostly good. I'll do the fuel tanks off camera. I don't think they're particularly interesting or vital to this build. Um, you know, the the aircraft I think is the main thing. Uh, unless anybody particularly wants a live stream on a fuel tank, in which case maybe that's the one I could do early morning for for down under people. <laughs> Not sure they'd be that pleased about that. Right, I'm going to break out my second secret weapon. It is not that. Where is it? What are you done with it? In a very similar jar to this. Old police caller. Unfortunately, I know I've taken one of, I've got two different ones, one from Green Stuff and one from, I think it's AK Interactive. Ah, it is AK Interactive because it is here. This stuff, I do prefer the AK Interactive one rather than the Green Stuff one. Uh, the Green Stuff one comes in, uh, what was that tin I just had, literally seconds before. The green stuff one comes in a tin like this. This is actually their sculpting Vaseline uh, they use with green stuff. Oh, yeah. um, but this is the size tin that theirs come in. Um, it's deeper than the, the AK one, but it is smaller. It just contains less. This camouflage plastic putty is fantastic. Um, several manufacturers make it. I say the AK one, um, I prefer of the two that I've used, I only have two that I've used. But this is a godsend. Oh, it's just like tar. It's kind of weird. If any of you remember or know of Silly Putty, um, that's stuff from the was it, early 80s. Um, this doesn't bounce, I don't believe. Um, but unlike Silly Putty, this doesn't stain. So if you put this on, and all you do, so let's just get a part of the camouflage here. So we're going to mask the green, right? So uh, that follows the line. One thing you can you know, mould it in whatever lines. So it goes around this um, fuel cap, maybe, and it kind of goes over this line here like so and then it comes sort of up around almost to this panel line and it sort of does a little wave and it kind of goes wavy across there and then Oh. So this stuff, you just put on like this. And now you can either, you know, continue with this and do the whole thing like that. Or, of course, you could just tape the areas roughly and then do the edges with, with this stuff. But this is great. We're doing hard lined camouflage. It is fantastic. And of course, the Cold War British ones were hard lined for this scale, at least. So, and if you don't like it, you see, you can adjust it. I'm just going to go in here and sort of pull this bit back to give more of that deep wave in. And then pull this back more to a a wave going off like that. So, absolutely great stuff. And um, 
absolutely you can reuse it dean that's um, that's one of the great things about it i've used this several times already you cannot tell i don't know how many times you can reuse it but it's not that expensive i think i paid 14 pounds something like that for this so what about 16 dollars and you get you know a substantial amount it's uh, it's not insubstantial but it is oh you know, I wish I could have used it in the past because the solutions that I have used in the past which kind of do similar things to this have either stained the areas where they've been or just been a bit crap <laughs> so you can do this with liquid masking for instance uh, the thing with liquid mask is you really need to go over it two or three times to build up a thick layer because if not it's difficult to take off and sometimes it does react with the, the paint underneath so the other good thing about this of course is you don't have to be super accurate because again we are only really trying to protect our pre-shading so the actual you know, kind of definitive start and end of where the camouflage is isn't that important to us we're really just trying to get the broad areas making sure we're preserving that pre-shading so that when we actually do come in with the second color we're not losing it because we've got you know another layer of paint underneath It's also a lot more fun than using tape. <laughs> it is. It is a lot like the blob. <laughs> All that stuff from, um, if any of you saw the episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, where Lieutenant Tasha Yar is absorbed by the creature. That is definitely what this looks like. And, and yeah, if you put it in a blob like this, yeah, which is how I left it in that tin. When I opened that tin and showed you guys, did you see it was just smooth? It, it does. So it is kind of a liquid, you know, but it's just really, really viscous. <laughs> Interesting stuff. Interesting material. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is it is much faster um, than going through a lot of other masking methods. So one of the other ways that I've done this in the past is by cutting paper masks. You know, just cutting paper to the rough shape and uh, and tacking that down with liquid mask or things like blue tack or something. Um, that's a pain. You know, you have to print out at scale. And uh, of course, a print is a two dimensional. This is a two dimensional representation you know, of a three dimensional object. So a paper mask won't entirely replicate the reality of what you have. Which means that you then sort of have to patch bits and squeeze it and it's just a bit of a pain so when it actually comes to the sides again i'll hard mask off our previously um, painted area so that we preserve that work that we just did I'm saying we a lot, but I feel like you guys are involved. You should share in the in the glory and or failure, depending on how it goes. What I'm saying is, if it looks bad, it's your fault, right? <laughs> yeah, blue tack and white tack similar kind of things but they do you know they do hold oils which do 
love primer and will end up in there and of course the last thing you actually want in areas that you're going to paint is oils <laughs> art oils i should say um, right so we cover this yeah and i like it as well because you know like i just did there you can cover specific things you know and then you know, come over it's supposed to be half over this so you can kind of use various details on the model as waypoints to then inform where this is going to try and get the right thing whereas if you're doing this with um, something like liquid masking once you put it on you put it on right you either have to take it off and if you put it on a lot in like a large area and it's dried that'll, that'll risk at least tearing up the whole lot um whereas this you can modify um really to your heart's content So here we actually don't quite come to that panel line. Let's just roll that back a little bit. And then we sort of wave out to over the panel line. And we sort of come back in. And yeah, as you can see, it sticks to itself really well. It's a weird stuff because it feels like it should be greasy. Right? It's sort of. It feels like plastic. It's it's a weird stuff. I presume it is some sort of polymer based thing. But I would heartily recommend it. I should really get some in the shop. I do have a few of AK's bits and pieces, the streaking grimes, the oil sets, all of those. They're uh, all pretty good. Um, so that's a good question as well. Do I recommend a stand like this? Um, I would say yes. Um, so I've not used stands like this before. Um, but as you can see, I'm not the tidiest modeler, right? You know, just a, a quick look around the you know, bench there shows a lot of stuff around. And it's really easy to, especially once you've painted an area, Right, that's quite a thin layer. You know, we've misted over pre shading. So that's what a few microns thick. You know, the, the smallest thing on your bench can scratch that. So it just protects you from those kinds of things. Um, and it also makes it balanced, you know. <laughs> and I also sell them. <laughs> just. <laughs> I don't have them on the website yet. That's another thing I need to uh, to put on. But yeah, they are they are pretty useful. Right. So. about there and go kind of to there and there yeah. so yeah life with modeling camo putty is much easier than life before
Now, where things like paper masking actually excels is where you want a nice faded edge. You know, and you're not confident about your freehanding skills. Um, you can make a paper rendition of your mask. And you can actually use something like this or um, little bits of card or whatever just to stand it off your model a bit. And then obviously as you're airbrushing, the air will come in and it won't form an absolute razor sharp line. It'll diffuse a little bit because of the way it works. As long as you do it from a fair distance. Obviously, if you're doing it right close up, it's not going to have the same effect. Um, but then you get a nice feathered edge to your camo. So it's really handy for doing those kinds of um, sort of faking those effects. That also works well if you're using a rattle can, of course, which is impossible to get any sort of fine control with. You're just blasting an area. And paper mask can create a nice, you know, soft edge. Uh, and you still get the rapidity, the speed, and sort of density of coverage of using a spray can. Okay, this is a weird piece of camo. So we're coming in near these fuel bits. Go back out and around them through this one. It's quite a nice waypoint. Yeah, so as you can see, you can kind of sculpt it on the model. This stuff. Uh, do I sell this stuff? As I say, I haven't got any in stock at the moment, but I do need to get some in. As I say, I can I do stock AK stuff. I just don't happen to have any of this at the moment. It, it's it's one of those things, you know, when I was saying about what stock do you get. So to start with, I wanted to get in a good supply of kits because I think kits is often what draws modelers into a shop. Even if then they're only buying, you know, some Tamiya paints that they remember they need while they're there. Um, having a good variety selection of kits at a reasonable price, I think, is a good hook, if you like. Um, and then if you've got all of the, the other stuff, you can build that up. And uh, that's that's kind of where I am at the moment. I need to build up that stock. And it's only through going through things like this that you realise, oh, yeah, I need to get that. Because I certainly do need to get that. So obviously where the roundels are going to go doesn't really matter too much <laughs> about where those exact lines are. And of course, for things like this, I'm I'm not a stickler for the exact camo panel. I, I know some people would be, you know, it actually has to be, you know, down to the millimetre. As you can probably gather, that's not me. That's a, that's a good question. So like Nunu, if I'm doing freehand, I never mark it with a pencil beforehand. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons. Uh, the main one being that actually pencil can show through um, quite badly, actually. So you're just kind of making problems for yourself, potentially. Right. Um, before I carry on with this putty, I'm just going to lift that. I'm actually going to do the hard edge masking where we painted before.
Now, normally I would let this cure overnight before I put masking tape on. I'm hoping this doesn't lift any. It is pretty light tack. Fingers crossed. Generally, if you've got a primer down and you're just using very light tack tape, you should be okay. But we'll see. I've had plenty of occasions where I should be okay and it hasn't been. <laughs> Let's say that. Yeah, so there is that um, thing about the pencil, you know, it can actually, especially if you're doing light coats, you're still, you can still see the pencil and then it looks crap, right? Um, the other thing is, you know, it takes as long to mark out with a pencil, really, I feel, as it does to actually just do it. And I think just doing it also improves your airbrushing skills. And if you get it wrong, again, you just use your airbrushing skills that you are developing, go back over it, right? So I know some people do pencil mark um, for camo, but I've never really seen the point like Nunu. And yes, yeah, sometimes it does drive you absolutely insane. Especially when you do a piece that you think, oh yeah, I got that right, and then you look and you've done, and I've done this before, I'll tell you, you realise you've done the wrong colour. <laughs> uh, yes, personal experience, you know, you get it on and you think, yeah, I've made a really good job of that, and you say, oh, wait a minute, it's the other way around. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Uh, is the Dornier DO17 Zeller a good kit? I believe it is. I mean, I think, really, any of the new Airfix kits um, you're not going to be disappointed with. Uh, if you're talking about the old Airfix Dornier 17, that's a different story. That is a, uh, a kit of its time, let's say. Uh, if you're brush painting, yeah, you're far less likely to get um, pencil marks going through because you're painting, oops, you're applying a much thicker layer of paint, generally. Although, of course, there are many ways around that. It is a sweeping generalization. I can't really justify. Okay. Now we have this interesting scenario with the intakes because the lip of them is the underside colour. Oh, sorry, it's the upper colour, but the air intakes themselves are not. But we'll into that, that's all green. So I mush that over a bit. I can ignore that for the time being. Now, uh, the other thing to note about this stuff is because it is this sort of effectively is like this tar stuff, this like polymer tar. If you leave this over time, it will 
settle down. So you can't just do this and then come back two days later and spray it because it will be it will settle down lower. So joining the airbrush crew, um, I would say it really depends what you want to get out of modeling. Um, you know, there is there is no definitive, right? There's no definitive saying, yes, you should get an airbrush. Um, airbrushes have certain advantages. Right? They are quicker. So if speed is a thing, um, airbrushing can get over big models, I would say. Um, some small models you can get um, painted faster with a uh, with a hairy stick, but generally, if you're doing a big area, so basically, if you're working on like seventy second scale bombers or forty eight scale up, um, an airbrush is going to save you time. Um, there are some camouflages which are a lot easier with airbrush. Um, it's not impossible to do even German model camouflage by hairy brush, hairy stick, sorry, or your brush. Um, but it's a hell of a lot easier than an airbrush. So convenience, speed, um, the paint cost is the same. The detractors are, there is obviously the initial investment the equipment, both the airbrush and whatever compression source you're using. It's also compressed there. Um, you know, maintenance of the airbrush is something. You've got to keep it clean. Um, and depending on what you get, that can be harder or easier. You know. um, and you've got to develop the skill because it's not just a matter of you know, you take it out and you're going to be Leonardo da Vinci. Um, it is different. You have to learn some skills. I wouldn't say it's difficult. It's just it takes some time. You know, it's just one of those things. Like, you don't pick up a brush and are instantly good. You just have to develop those skills. So it really depends what you want out of it. I probably said this on multiple streams now, but I do have an almost completed video on exactly this subject. Um, in fact, I just was putting tacky stuff on there. Let me show you. So I have three Spitfires here. One of them was painted with a, an airbrush. One of them was painted with a brush. And one of them was painted with a spray can. And there are various levels of dirty, so don't let that um, <laughs> put you off or change it. But uh, this one has also been weathered and the other two haven't got to that stage yet. So, I mean, I don't know if you guys can tell. Um, I'm next to them. Being close up, you can see some differences, some small differences. Um, I'll tell you for free, this is the smoothest finish of them all. And that was Raffle Can. So it's absolutely possible to make a model, uh, and, and I didn't put a huge amount of time into those, I must say. So, you know, a, uh, a much better brush painter than I could probably make a much better job of uh, smoothing out you know, the finish. 
The difference though is time and cost. So I can tell you the, the brush took nine minutes to prime it because I primed it with brush as well. Uh, 12 minutes to do the underneath, 13 minutes to do the top, and uh, four minutes to um, gloss coat it. Uh, to play. Should I do them all? Um, the spray, the airbrush, took six minutes to prime, five minutes to do the underside. Four minutes to do or five minutes to do both of the top coats five minutes five minutes um the spray can took a minute and a half to prime 40 seconds to do the underside a minute and a half to do both top coats but the brush painting was the cheapest uh the spray cans were the most expensive and the airbrush is somewhere in between if you take out the or, or factor in the fact that the uh, airbrush is a one-off cost you know uh, and amortize that over time so you know you pay your money and you take your choice <laughs> so yeah exactly um airbrushing is great for large areas and you get nicer finishes but there's definitely a place for brush painting yeah well that, that is another really good point right you will never ever get away from brush painting because unless you don't bother doing any of the details on your model because you still need to do all the little fiddly bits right and uh, if if you want to do those you're not using an airbrush or a, a spray can on those so you know you'll always be doing some and brushing. Have I got any Umbrol 127 yet? <laughs> no, I haven't. Look, the uh, the order hasn't come in from Humbrol yet. Um, and it will be enamel when it comes because I'm not getting Humbrol acrylics no matter what anybody says. <laughs> Unless everybody asks for them. And so far that hasn't happened. Yeah, exactly. Um, Dean, so if you have an airbrush, as I said, the maintenance is is a part of it, right? It is uh, like any tool, anything with mechanical moving parts will suffer wear. And um, so I'm just trying to work out exactly how this goes. Right. Um, yeah, so you do have to clean it. If you don't clean it, it will get blocked, and then you have to take the whole thing apart and do more extreme cleaning or replace parts, or <laughs> if you really messed it up, get a new airbrush. Uh, so that can get expensive. I always say to people, uh, and some people disagree, some people say, oh, you know, you need to get a passion eye water or you know, badger or something to make your first experience a good one. I think that is. The wrong advice i would i would get to amazon buy the cheapest airbrush you can uh, airbrush do make called fender i think it is it's a chinese brand They're like i got one for 16 pounds i think it was less than 20 dollars um and that's the one i've been using tonight um i know that uh nunu probably doesn't agree with me but um i think high-end airbrushes are a waste of your time unless you are a high-end airbrusher and i don't think you get that by not going through the process of understanding airbrushes and you will inevitably make mistakes so my philosophy is you make them on cheap airbrushes where if you knack the airbrush completely the cost of that Fender airbrush I bought was less than the cost of a new nozzle piece, the end of my nozzle for my harder and steam back, which I really do not rate. That may just be a me thing, but you know, 
Again, page money takes your choice. I think unless you are doing freehand tiny details, like if you're doing model camouflage on night fighters on German 172nd scale aircraft, that is the time I think that high-end airbrushes really start to come into play, or if you're doing uh, airbrush and model figures. So, you know, my Warhammer figures or 116th scale busts and things and your airbrushing veins and th that's when you need an airbrush with you know, super control super fine 0.2 millimeter or lower nozzles and stuff if you're effectively using it like a directed spray gun <laughs> don't think you need that and i think you'd be doing yourself a disservice to your pocket anyway i think cut your teeth on something cheap and graduate up to to something that you feel like you deserve, you know, or just go through a whole load of cheap ones, very much up to you. I would actually say, so there are, you can get for about 35 pounds, about $40, you can get these little handheld airbrush compressors and airbrush. Um, they're not actually, but the airbrush that comes with them is generally just like one of the cheap airbrushes, is like nothing. Um, and the little compressor you get with them is, um, I mean, they're not great, but they'll supply, you know, 25, 30 psi air for your airbrush. So for starting, it's a good place to start with, you know, and especially. I would say start with things like priming your model with the airbrush just to get the feel of it and that sort of thing is good what i would say if you're going to do that is buy a hose because those they call them like portable or handheld airbrushes um the little compressor is way too heavy and it's connected to the airbrush to hold in your hand and have any sort of decent control of it um, so you really want a yeah, hose to connect the little compressor to it so that you just want to be holding the airbrush in your hand because that's how you're going to use any airbrush if you've got like this compressor thing. I've got one here. Hang on a second. Uh, just bear with me. Yeah, this is the sort of thing. This one um, actually comes with a, a removable battery, so that um, you know when it runs out, you can put it to charge. I think I've got three batteries, so each of them gives enough um, for about twenty minutes. I think ten minutes is it, and it takes twenty minutes to charge. Are good enough so that you can cycle them continuously. Um, but I've got my quick fit adapter there, so I can put a hose in, and then I can just, I've got quick fit adapters on all of my airbrushes and on my compressors, so I can swap between them without having to unscrew these all the time. You do lose a little bit of air pressure through those, um, not air pressure, but they do leak a little bit uh, sometimes, um, but it's not a big thing, really. Now, the convenience massively outweighs any detriment um, to the lifetime of your you know compressor um air tank you know you might lose five minutes out of my big whatever it is 80 litre or whatever um tank there it's not really a big thing so that's ideal but you don't want to be holding in your hand it is what's that i don't know pound and a half maybe doesn't sound much but it's completely artificial the main weight of an airbrush should be here yeah, oh, sorry. It should be here in the body. It shouldn't be here pulling down. You, know, you shouldn't be having to. This is a very okay. Holding that like that feels really, really weird. Don't learn like that. <laughs> you know. So get a hose if you're going to do that. Um, but the other thing is the quality of the air that comes through. This is something that people often forget. Um, if you're going to go into airbrushing, 
get a compressor graduate as soon as you can to a decent compressor which has a water trap because one of the things you'll find with a small compressor that goes all the time um is it will gradually like it's compressing right it's compressing the air especially if you're in a humid area that means it's also compressing water water vapor and that'll come out through the brush and it will do it at the worst time and it'll go and uh, a load of diluted paint will just spray all over your model at the worst time so that obviously is not what you want and not a good experience so i would say the compressor your air supply which is really what is you know ending up pushing the paint onto the model is as important as the uh the airbrush so it's much more of a package deal um with an airbrush Okay, uh, I am aware that the time is rocking on, um, but also that I don't want to leave this messed up for it all to just. So I'm going to very quickly mask this last piece and let's see if we can get some grey on this before we finish tonight. Speed masking now. If such a thing exists, um, well, it does now. Yeah, I wouldn't. Sorry, that was something I should put it up on the screen. To be honest, and this may be controversial, I wouldn't buy any tools or. Um, um what do you call them accessories like airbrushes or um paint stands or any tools and accessories i wouldn't buy from any of the major manufacturers fairfix included um i just think generally they don't make those things right so what they have is other people's rebranded stuff um which means that somebody else is making it cheaper or better than they are. They're not experts in it, so why would you? Why would you do that? You know, um, go somewhere else. If you're going to buy a cheap one, get it off eBay. Fender, as I say, are uh, a decent inverted commas cheap brush. You know, it'll work. The thing with the cheaper brushes is they are more difficult to clean than more expensive brushes, right? So, like the harder and steam back, the one thing I like about it is it's got removable cups, so that's it's much easier to get in and clean all of the crap out. Um, it's a bit harder in uh, in a finger. Um, but having said that, knowing how to clean an airbrush out properly is a really important skill to develop. So, it's not entirely a bad thing that you know you have to clean it out thoroughly. It means when you do graduate to you know, getting a, if you do graduate to getting a, a medium stroke high end airbrush, you will treat it properly, you know, and you know how to do it. So, again, not a bad thing. I think that's all the green masked, right? Right. What I'm going to do is quickly do the grey on top and not just around here where the underside of this is because I don't want to F that up. In fact, sod it, that's, uh, it'll take two seconds, right? Just quickly mask this up. I'm only doing the underside, just a couple of pieces of tape on each. Should be good. So, what is this? Is that dark sea grey or ocean grey? Dark sea grey, okay. That's good. I've got dark sea grey for sure. Something approaching dark sea grey at least. Seems I never use exact colours. Because <laughs> even if I do use an exact colour, I'm going to add some 
some dark or some light to it, right? So do some color modulation at some point. So it's never going to be an exact color at some point. Okay. Yeah, there we go. It's fine. Uh, is that really green? No. That's weird. It shows it as green on this side, but it looks grey on all of the other bits. So I'm going to ignore the fact that Airfix have said that this little bit at the end is, is green on that. All right. Extra dark sea grey. No, just dark sea grey. Dark sea grey. Dark sea grey. Oh, well, we're mixing and matching tonight. This is a Gun Sangyo hobby colour. Oh, no, that's, uh, that's RM74, not... Um, it said dark grey. I think it said dark sea grey. Oh my god, I've got a million greys here. I can't see the right one. Uh, medium sea grey. Um, so many greys. Okay. We'll go with Hataka, as we mentioned Hataka right at the beginning. Is my vortex it's not working? Yeah, okay. Just got to really give it a really damn good shake. <laughs> yes, it can be a bit daunting. Oh, no, that was not what I wanted to show, although. Thirty pounds, including delivery, is a pretty good deal for an airbrush. Um, it can be a bit daunting airbrushing. I, I think there's a lot of BS spoken about airbrushing by those that know. I, I think it's gatekeeping, right? Um, I think the best thing to do is just dive in. That's what I did. You know, I I didn't really know what I was doing. And this is in the days <laughs> right, where there was no internet. Um, I just, I had the leaflet from Badger. Well, it wasn't actually from Badger. The leaflet was from Badger. The airbrush wasn't. The airbrush was a Badger copy, which I still have. Badger 150 copy. And um, I the little leaflet that you know, told you how to spray dots and then join the dots with lines and, and draw shapes and then shaded circles and all this sort of thing. I was just like, what the hell is it talking about? And tried to do it and just, you know, make lots of mistakes. Um, but you learn from it, you know? You learn from what you do wrong. You gradually get a feel for the pressure and how thin the paint should be. And, you know, somebody said, oh, it should be, um, I think the booklet said it should be the consistency of milk. It's like, well, that's not very helpful. What sort of milk? So, so it's a bit of a voyage of discovery. But at the end of the day, you know, if you spend 20 or 30 pounds on an airbrush and it all goes wrong, it's not the end of the world, is it? So yeah, we won't get it to tonight because after this, I will be uh, heading off. Um, but exactly so, I'll be uh, I'll be retracing out the areas, uh, just reversing it, and then uh, going over in green. Or what I could do is just freehand the green because that's a different technique, right? If you guys would prefer that. I'm happy to do that as well. We can decide on the night, I guess. 
I just noticed a bit where the child missed there. So, you know, after all of that, this looks very similar to the primer. <laughs> So I'm coming in a little heavy with this, more than I would normally, just because I am aware of time. I mean, there is a noticeable difference, right? It's a bit blue or grey. And again, the camera picks it up differently than the eye does. It doesn't look as blue as... Uh, as it appears on the camera there. Our eyes and cameras work in slightly different ways, which is why they look different on screen to reality. I think, yeah, next time probably I'll freehand the green. Because then you guys have seen you know, three different ways of spraying, basically with you know, taped off masking, um, camo putty, and freehand them. All in the same model. Tell that was the compressor cutting in. <laughs> That's the other thing about airbrushing, of course. Um, thank you, Dean. That's very much appreciated. Um, yeah, the other thing with airbrushing is you do have to be aware that compressors make a a lot of noise. <laughs> so if you're going to do spraying at night, uh, it is almost 10 o'clock here. Uh, fortunately, I, I live in a very rural area and I'm in a garage which has pretty decent soundproofing. Um, but again, you have to consider what your neighbour's going to think with your compressor running. Um, and it's not an insubstantial um, thing to consider, right? <laughs> you don't want to get thrown out of your, your flat or castigated by neighbours because you've got a noisy compressor running at all hours of the day and night. Okay. So, see, again, I've, I've put on more paint than I would normally at once here. Um, and also, Hataka does seem to uh, to be a bit wetter um, when it uh, when it goes on a model. Um, but you can see here what we are doing. So with Hataka, I typically put at least two of the base coats on before I try doing any lightening and then in, you know boosting that contrast um, because of, uh, just because of the way the paint is. Uh, the way I find it, it is a bit uh, 
Uh, well, let's say watery. <laughs> the other thing you can do, of course, is use your airbrush with. So I am just pushing air through here. So normally you pull back to get the paint. I got it fully forward. I've actually pushed it forward. So it's definitely closing it. Just to basically try and dry off some of the uh, wetter areas. Or another great investment if you're airbrushing is this beast. So this is a little handheld hairdryer. This one actually uh, was bought for our dog. <laughs> Before we had the dog, I didn't realize that actually he's got so little hair, it doesn't need drying. <laughs> so this is not plugged in. So it doesn't make any noise. So this has a couple of settings. A low one, which is really good for speeding up drying of acrylic paint um i wouldn't recommend it used on like enamels or lacquers um you don't really want to introduce heat sources with those kinds of paints that tends to end badly. I've also just realized I've made a, a, a mistake because of my haste. I have not masked off this little bit, so I'm going to have to re-mask off this area and re-spray that white there. Oops. But again, you know, small mistake, easily rectified, nothing to cry over. And that, I think, brings us to the end of the, uh, the stream. Let me just check the comments do you throw the masking tack or we use it no no it is reusable um i've used this a couple of times already um in fact i think did i use this on spit no i use liquid mask on spitfire but i have used this before um and yeah it just peels right off we just put it all in the, the tin and it's good to go um okay votes for freehand so i will uh we I will go over this uh, again um, just to increase that the density of it because it's a bit patchy, a bit thin. Um, and then I will probably come in and just lighten some of these bigger areas just to boost the contrast you know, from the pre-shading. Um, but you've already seen all of that already on the underside, so you're not missing anything there. I'll just do it to advance things forward a little bit before. Next time, we'll actually do the, the green. I'll put on the, um, well, I use this gloss coat, the pledge, and we'll get to putting those thousands of decals on. I will probably just put the big ones on stream <laughs> because I don't think you guys want to see me struggle with, you know, 200 tiny little stencils. Um, so we'll just put the big ones on and, uh, and call that good, I think. Then we can move to some of the the sub-assembly bits, putting the landing gear on and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but that is the stream for tonight. Thank you very much for bearing with me through my errors of putting in the um, the wrong AM rather than PM on the timing. As I say, I'll put a, I will put up a special early morning stream for all of the down unders um, for disappointing them that time. Uh, it won't be this, but maybe. Um, Maybe something else. Well, it will be something else, obviously, if it's not going to be this. But I'll think about what what it is. Um, maybe maybe an Aussie themed or a New Zealand themed topic would be appropriate for that. But um, thanks everybody for for joining. Um, I hope uh, you did enjoy it. Uh, if not, we probably won't see you next time. <laughs> I hope you did, and I will see you next time. I'll try and get the timing right for that. Um, it'll probably be Friday night. Um, I've got a lot of other stuff to do through the rest of the week. So thank you so much for your time. It really means a lot to me. And uh, I'll see you next time. Cheers, everyone.